All right. Welcome, everyone, to our webinar today about circular economy in the built environment. Uh, today's lecture is by Nico Schouten and Andrew McHugh from Metabolic, based in the Netherlands. And they will be talking about the practical application of circular economy principles to the built environment from design to deconstruction. They're going to talk about topics like urban mining and circular building design and circularity in neighborhood development. I want to welcome all of you in the audience today. We have architecture students from Baltimore in the United States and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, we have architecture and construction firms and other attendees uh, from all around the world today. And a very special welcome to the students from Morgan State University, a school of architecture and planning in Baltimore. In today's uh, webinar, we will first have some short introductory remarks by me and Christina Murphy from the Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning. And then the speakers will talk about uh, 50 minutes or so um, and after that, we'll have about 20 minutes of discussion where the speakers are going to answer questions from you, the audience. And Jeremiah Ekoja, a graduate student from Morgan State University, will be moderating the Q&A. So big thank you to Jeremiah for doing that. Um, before we get started, I wanted to say a couple words about the Baltimore-Rotterdam Sister City relationship. Uh, Baltimore in the state of Maryland in the U.S. and Rotterdam in the Netherlands became sister cities in 1985. Um, the sister city relationship is managed by the Baltimore-Rotterdam Sister City Committee, and we are all volunteers, um, and this is a nonprofit organization. The committee is based in Baltimore, but we have some volunteers in the Netherlands that help us with our activities. We promote economic cultural, educational, health, environmental, and other types of collaboration and exchanges between the Baltimore and Rotterdam regions. And in recent years, many of our projects have environmental sustainability themes. And uh, because of our collaborations now with the Morgan State University School of Architecture Planning, we're also focusing on architecture and urban design themes. I will go ahead now and hand over the microphone to my colleague, Christina Murphy from Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for opening this lecture. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Applying Circular Economy Principles to the Built Environment by Nikos Houten and Andrew McHugh from Metabolic. This lecture is occurring within a very exciting and continuing collaboration with the Baltimore Rotterdam Committee and Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning in Baltimore. Specifically, this third webinar ties into the SAP graduate class, Architectural Technology Building Materials, which recurrent themes include origins and manufacture, construction, maintenance of materials. Related questions are, is the raw material plenty, rare, not re 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 renewable? How much will be recycled? How much energy is necessary in making the product? What pollution is emitted in the air, water, soil? Can waste become new products? Energy and transportation, pollution generated, energy to put the building together, pollution associated with installation, waste generated, and how much can be recycled. How much does the building use over its lifetime, indoor air quality, comfort temperature, its maintenance, life of material. Demolition strategy, how to go about it. How much energy will be required? Can materials be recycled? Before handing over the floor to our speakers, please allow me to briefly introduce Nico and Andrew to you. Nico Scouten worked as a green building consultant at Metabolic with a background in architecture. He helps governments, architects, and developers to make their project more sustainable. While studying architecture at the TU Delft, Nico became interested in using architecture to make a more sustainable world. After he graduated in 2018, Nico worked at the AMS Institute as an in-house designer for, their, for the transformation of their office in Amsterdam, where he helped design and circular meeting space in 2018. Nico worked for a national think tank in 2018, together with other recent graduates on the circular transformation of metropolitan areas in the Netherlands, advising the government and companies on the steps to take. 
Andrew McHugh is a sustainable consultant at Metabolic. He has worked with cities like Philadelphia, Boulder, Fort Collins, Winnipeg, uh, Guelph, and Geneva on, trans on transitioning to a resilient, equitable, circular economy. Andrew graduated from the University of Vermont in 2014. He visited Baltimore in 2019 and participated in a circular economy panel discussion at Baltimore Impact Hub. Now, participant, after Nico and Andrew lecture, you're invited to address questions. Please do so by either raising your hand by clicking raise hand button. We especially invite the Morgan students to do so and ask questions verbally. Or you can ask questions by placing your questions into the Q&A option window located at the bottom of the screen. They will be answered following the order of placement. Also, you can, you're welcome to type general comments into the chat window, but please be aware that Nico and Andrew and the panelists might not see them. At this point, all please turn off your video and audio with the exception of Nico and Andrew, of course. Guys, take it away. Thank you, Christina. Thanks for the intro and, and thanks for having us here for this lecture. Um, I will give a, a brief introduction to metabolic. So actually, Nico, if you want to go on to the next slide and we can talk about the structure. I'm going to give a brief introduction to metabolic uh, and systems thinking in the circular economy. Uh, and then Nico is going to take you through his work in the built environment specifically, uh, diving into some case studies and how we can unlock the potential of the circular economy uh, in the built environment. So if we can go to the next slide, the first question is, who are we? Why are we talking to you today? Um, on the next slide, you'll see that Metabolic uh, is actually an ecosystem of five different organizations uh, working with governments, businesses, and NGOs uh, to drive global systems change. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see a bunch of our pretty faces. Um, our mission is to transition the global economy to a fundamentally sustainable state as fast as possible. Um, to us, that means uh, meeting all human needs within the, the thresholds of our planet. At this point, we are about 80 people based in Amsterdam. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we have created ourselves in this structure uh, to have five different what we call vehicles for change. So Metabolic is not just one entity. We are a consultancy uh, that works with businesses, governments, and NGOs on short-term monitoring, impact assessment, strategies, transitions, uh, we have a not-for-profit think tank, a research institute that does more applied research, um, filling in the knowledge gaps that are needed to create a circular economy, doing much more long-term public benefit research in sort of academic consortia over you know, three to five years. Think uh, European Green Deal, Horizon 2020 sort of work. Uh, we also have a venture building arm. It takes the insights from our consultancy and from our research think tank um, and tries to design uh, entrepreneurial approaches to gaps we see in the market um, and to not just design solutions, but redesign the way a, a business structure works and a, a funding structure works to create virtuous incentives instead of perverse incentives uh, and help build that systems change. Uh, we also have a software team that's working really hard to make our consulting team more or less obsolete by automating a lot of those analyses and turning them into easy to use decision support tools um, so that this knowledge can get out there and everyone can start making more informed decisions. Um, and then we have a community-based foundation in the Caribbean that uses uh, bottom-up makerspace approaches and citizen science um, to promote circular economy uh, on the islands where they work. Uh, and this just gives us a number of different ways to uh, pursue systems change. And that we're not gonna do it just as a consultancy. We're not gonna do it just as researchers. Um, but by doing this all under the same umbrella, we're able to combine the, the skills and knowledge across these different entities. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that while we are based in Amsterdam, uh, we therefore have a lot of work in Europe, we're also quite active in uh, North America, Southeast Asia, and we've done a growing body of work in Australia and in South America, uh, hoping to start working in Africa shortly. Um, this is a over 400 projects over the past eight and a half years, I think, um, making us one of the sort of deepest benches on circular economy work out there. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that we organize our focus on this sort of systems change, getting the, the global economy to a fundamentally sustainable state. It's a big ask, a lot of different topics within there. Um, so we focus our work on six um, critical transitions that need to happen. 
uh, cities and regions is one of our major transition areas, and that's what we'll be talking about today. But we also do a lot of work in food, biodiversity, and land use, uh, products and services, manufacturing, um, in finance and financial models, uh, in governance, uh, both public and, and private sector governance, and uh, importantly, in mindset shifts. How do we think about resources and our relationships to each other and to uh, the world around us? Because um, that's ultimately how we're going to get there. So that already sort of cues up the next thing. We talk about systems thinking. Metabolic identifies as a systems thinking uh, or a systems change organization. Why is that? We're not just a circular economy entity. Uh, it's because uh, these transitions require not just sort of siloed focus, but a full systems transformation. You're not going to put to sort of widget fixes, uh, little technologies uh, here and there to have uh, incremental change and get us to where we need to go. Um, we're focusing on systems change because we're currently living in exponential times. So Nico, if we go to the next slide. Uh, these should be um, unfortunately familiar graphs by now, uh, the famous hockey stick. Uh, we're seeing exponential growth in all aspects of our modern society from population growth to deforestation and biodiversity loss to foreign direct investment, flooding, drought occurrences, and of course, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they're all going up in an exponential curve. We all learned the hard way uh, how quickly an exponential curve can get out of control this past year with COVID-19. And so we need to be looking for exponential solutions to these exponential curves. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that a lot of these, uh, these expon this exponential increase in population and in consumption is also putting a huge drain on our planet and on the materials and resources on the planet. So this is uh, a visualization of the global material flows in 2010, I think, all of the resources being extracted around the world and where they're going. Uh, and what you notice if you look over at the right-hand side of it is that it just sort of dwindles away to nothing and none of it goes back to its prior uses. And so this is a big problem for us. It's resulting in, if you go to the next slide, a lot of extremely undesirable effects, uh, things like drought, uh, mass forced migration, floods, um, disruptions to supply chains, um, and it's becoming a huge problem for us. And this is what we're calling uh, the linear economy. Um, what the current operating state for the world is, is this, uh, this simplified model here where we take materials out of the planet, uh, we make them into products, and then we waste those resources when we are done with those products. It's a, it's a mass simplification, but it's essentially how our society works today. Um, and this is driving us, unfortunately, outside of important thresholds. These are the uh, nine planetary boundaries from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, easy way to think about these, these are nine earth systems or natural systems that support human life on earth. Um, easy stoplight visualization, if it's green, we're definitely safe. If it's red, we are well past the threshold where it's safe for humans. And what you'll see here is that actually uh, nutrient loss under biogeochemical flows and uh, biospheric in uh, integrity, that's land use change and, and biodiversity loss, um, are far more urgent even than climate change. And we know that climate change is very urgent. So we have to do something and we have to do something pretty dramatic and pretty, very, pretty fast. Um, one of the answers has been flowing around today, and what we're going to be talking about today is the switch from a linear economy to a circular economy. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, a circular economy is, is just recycling um, or is zero waste. Uh, it is much more than that. And if we can go to the, the next slide, Nico. Um, the easy way to think about it is that currently we are taking materials out and we're making them into products and wasting it, but in a circular economy, instead of wasting those resources at the end of life, uh, they come back into use. And ideally they come back into use in as high a value and high, uh, highest level of complexity as possible. Um, perhaps the most famous diagram illustrating this is on the next slide, and that's the butterfly model um, populated by, uh, made popular by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation a few years ago. Um, what you're looking at here is a much more detailed view of how you would actually take those resources um, from the top of the diagram uh, and cycle them through multiple stages of use, both for something like a building or uh, a mobile phone, uh, which is on the right-hand side, a technological cycle, 
or for um, plants, biomaterials, food, um, which is a biological cycle. Of course, you're not going to repair a burger when it's uh, at its end of life. Um, there are different options that are available there. The important part about this diagram is that the different loops mean different things. And if you're looking at particularly on the right hand side of the screen, the smaller the circle, the more value is retained. So this is why we don't skip straight ahead to recycle because you see it's all the way out there on the edge. It's not a great business model. It's not making anyone much money. It's also not a great use of those resources or those products. And so ideally we would take products as they are and either reuse them or repair them if they need repairing or refurbish or turn them into to something else uh, just as complicated rather than breaking them down into glass, concrete, wood, whatever it is, and trying to reuse the raw materials. Now, the issue with uh, approaching a, from a, a circular economy focused only on materials uh, is that it can also produce some seriously undesirable effects. Um, so this is currently the, the state of what electronic recycling is in the world, in, in many parts of the world. And no one would look at this and say, this is the future we want to move towards. Uh, so for us at Metabolic, this is why uh, we need a systems thinking approach. We define a, a, a circular economy as something more complex than just materials. It's really about these seven pillars of the circular economy. It's a holistic approach to the circular economy that incorporates not just materials, but also energy, water, biodiversity, uh, human health and well-being, uh, society and cultures are, are being preserved. And importantly to me, um, the top left there, you'll see that value other than financial value is being created by our economy. And this is a, a holistic framework for us that we get used to assess the trade-offs between um, the perhaps greenhouse gas emission savings on one hand and waste generation on the other, or uh, the different complexities that might ar arise from the, the choices we have to make when we look at the embedded impacts of our buildings, our materials, our products, and how we consume them in, in society. Now, the, the way you actually start to operationalize this is to take a systems approach. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is all about understanding the dynamics between all of those seven pillars and that you're not gonna address something like waste or greenhouse gas emissions or water as a silo uh, or as something that exists on its own, but rather as something that exists in interaction with all these other items. They exist in interaction with the, the societies around them and also in interaction with the other earth systems that are being, uh, that are being leveraged to produce these products, these buildings, whatever they are. Um, by taking a systems approach, we're able to look at the root causes of negative outcomes, negative impacts, things like waste, greenhouse gas emission, um, and pick out interventions that would leverage real transformative change rather than just band-aids. Um, and importantly, this last point is that looking at the interactions between various different elements in a system will allow us to avoid burden shifting, um, which is very much like that uh, the slide uh, two slides ago with the child in uh, electronics recycling, that's a burden shift from uh, losing electronic material onto the human health and well-being of the communities that are recycling this stuff uh, by hand. By looking at these interactions, we're able to avoid um, what, this kind of burden shifting. Um, another way to think about it is it's very similar to a Rubik's Cube. Um, if you're trying to solve for just one color on the Rubik's Cube or just one side of the Rubik's Cube, uh, it's incredibly difficult uh, and you end up scrambling all the other sides. But if you understand the sort of algorithm underlying the Rubik's Cube and how the different pieces fit together, uh, you're able to solve the, the puzzle extremely quickly. And that's what we're aiming for. If we go to the, the next slide here, this is uh, personally for me how I like to think about the kinds of solutions we're looking for. These are the, the four levels of thinking. Um, if you think of uh, a problem and a solution and where it uh, has an impact, um, at the top of the pyramid events or outcomes are the easiest things to change. The amount of waste going to landfill in a given year uh, is an outcome. Uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in a given year is an outcome. It's pretty easy to make, uh, make change at this level um, but it's also on a large scale, rather ineffective. It's pretty incremental. You're not gonna transform anything with this. But these outcomes are caused by patterns of behavior. 
Um, and these patterns of behavior are ultimately caused by uh, structures. These could be physical structures like infrastructure. It could be social or political structures. It could also be um, legal structures or financial incentives. You know, people act in these certain patterns for certain reasons. Um, and if you start to interact here and change these structures, you can have much more impact, but it's much more difficult. And then finally, underlying all of this are these mental models. This is why we have that mindset transition in the, the transitions we're looking at. The mental model of how we understand ourselves and the world around us and our place in it, um, the paradigm that we operate in is the hardest thing to change. But if we are able to change it, it has the greatest effect. It is the highest leverage point. Um, so this is something that we're aiming to drive towards in our work uh, in transforming the global economy towards a, an equitable and resilient circular economy. We need to be changing uh, not just the, the outcomes, but rather the structures that produce those outcomes and the mental models underlying those. So here I will pass it off to Nico to talk about where do buildings and cities uh, and architecture fit into this picture. Yes, thank you, Andrew. So based on the whole story that Andrew just told us about systems thinking and uh, applying that systems thinking approach to the built environment, we usually start with this, this uh, set of data, or this set of information that we think, well, that we understand that cities occupy only 3% of the global land surface, and that's actually a very small part of the whole world, but consume the majority of both resources and greenhouse gases. That means that if we can redesign cities, if we can change cities, then we can uh, tackle a big part of this uh, consumption and this negative impact that we're having uh, on the world around us. And then cities consist, of course, of many things. Um, and, and we specifically focus uh, on the built environments, on the buildings in these cities. And that's also one of the majority of the, like the big topics that I want to tackle with you today. So this is uh, Dutch data, but it's relatively... Um, relevant uh, representative for the for the for the western uh, civilization where we can see that 40 percent of all energy consumption is uh, consumed by the built environment 50 to 60 percent of all material uses and 40 percent of all uh, co2 emissions are related to the built environment so again if within cities we can do something about the way we build buildings and the way we consume within buildings we can have a very very big impact and why is that important to just not not just think about, for instance, the materials, but have a very broad approach is uh, best visualized in this visual, I think, uh, where we did an analysis of the, uh, the yearly consumption of uh, the Dutch building sector, where on the left side, we can see all the mass of the material going in. So at the top, we see the aggregate level, the concrete uh, is, is second in line, and then we quickly go down to bricks with only 7% and steel with only 3%. But then when we see what impacts those relate to, is that, inst that uh, steel is representative of 35% of the CO2 impact, uh, where it's only 3% of the mass. So again, taking that systems perspective, not just thinking about the material, but also thinking about the embedded impact that you're tackling or that you're working with from a very broad scale can, uh, is really important if you want to work towards a more sustainable future and a more sustainable built environment. And how we think about that it was already briefly uh, addressed by Andrew, but a very good model to think about that from a circular perspective is uh, the value hill. So how can we go from a linear economy where we produce a lot of material uh, in several steps where each step requires attention, energy, money, and time uh, until the user uses a product for a certain amount of time and then uh, after the end of its life is all the, all the value in this product is completely destroyed. How can we take that model and actually turn it into a different model where we reuse the material, repair and maintain the material as long as possible, and then refurbish it to actually keep the value that we've installed in the product at the highest level, uh, highest level possible. And this way of circular thinking is very present in our work and uh, I'll hopefully explain a bit more about uh, that to you over the next uh, half an hour. Another thing that's very important for us to understand is that the circular economy is not just about material, but it, uh, as briefly, previously stated, it's much more. So when you look at the development of the percentage of circular material use in the world, we can see actually that the world hasn't become circular, more circular in the past uh, two years. 
but we do need to understand that the circular economy is the key way to reduce the virgin material use and therefore also reduce the greenhouse gas emissions for a vast majority and these 39 percent are essential in us reaching the goal not only the climate paris uh, paris climate agreement goals but overall just keeping sure that our uh, world can remain inhabitable and, and livable for the for the generations to come so what we need to do is we need to transform our economy and we can do that by radically changing the way we design and plan our cities and design the value change that actually are uh, present within those cities and then the question quickly arises when we take this systems approach and we have this very broad uh, view on what sustainability looks like how can we actually translate these ambitious targets into concrete solutions and measurable results that we can use to achieve the systemic transformation and i want to address uh, these questions uh, based on two cases that um, I think are very relevant. Uh, one shows more a bottom-up approach uh, and the other a more top-down. Uh, and I'm going to discuss those uh, with you now. So the first uh, case that I'm going to discuss is the Keuvel in Amsterdam and how we use that bottom-up experimentation to uh, increase the incremental growth of sustainability uh, within the city of Amsterdam and uh, how that worked. So for all of you who don't know, uh, the Keuvel is a redevelopment project that uh, Metabolic worked on eight years ago now. And the site that the Keuvel is located on was a former shipyard in Amsterdam, which was to be transformed into a circular blueprint for urban development. And together with our consortium partners, we, we developed this area uh, and populated it with 17 renovated houseboats uh, that we made as sustainable as possible and uh, used opened up for for social initiatives and social entrepreneurs to do to, to their work there at the same time this place is also an experimentation zone that we can use to um, that we can use to to try out new sustainability techniques and and also prove how sustainability could uh, how the sustainable future or the sustainable world of tomorrow could look like so i will start by taking you back to the beginning this is the abandoned shipyard that we started with and it is uh, as you can see, quite <laughs> empty at, uh, at the beginning when we started the project. And also the, the soil was uh, very heavily polluted. Um, as uh, over centuries, even uh, this, this area had been used as a shipyard, a lot of heavy metals actually seeped into the ground and it was very hard to redevelop it into something new. So what we did, we started with creating a plan. What should we do to get this and how can we create as much impact as possible by uh, renovating this area? So we started by finding building materials and we did it by um, looking for building materials within the city of Amsterdam. And what we found is that houseboats were actually, which are very present in the city of Amsterdam, of course, could be uh, reused very easily by uh, uh, putting them on land. And it had a benefit in two ways. On one hand, the material is very cheap and easy to reuse. On the other hand, by constructing and re, uh, reconfiguring these boats underwater, we had uh, less building permits to take care of and we could actually experiment uh, much more. <clears throat> so after finding these boats and uh, retrofitting them, we put them on the land and we tried to connect them. But because the soil was so polluted, it was actually not allowed uh, to put uh, pavement on the ground. So what we did is we put this boardwalk in between the boats that connected them all. And in between the boardwalk and the boat, we planted all these different uh, species of plants that we use to um, do phytoremediation. And phytoremediation is the practice of cleaning ground uh, using plants. So each year we replant these plants and then after a full season of growing, we harvest them and we actually treat them as chemical waste because at that time they are. Because throughout the years, the roots of these plants actually take out uh, the heavy metals from the soil and store it in, in the plants. And by doing so, we are slowly but surely um, cleaning, cleaning the area by just do it, letting nature do its work. At the same time, we also worked on a lot of sustainability interventions and they reached all the way from very high tech, so working with solar panels uh, to generate energy and electricity to more uh, low tech uh, interventions. And this low tech one is a halophyte filter that uses pebbles and uh, roots from plants to actually clean gray water that's coming from the houseboats. So by doing so, we didn't have to put any sewage system in place, but we could really locally clean the water and it by uh, after letting it run through these two tubs uh, with plants, it is clean enough so that we can actually um, put it in the, uh, the surface water of the city of Amsterdam and therefore really working on this local uh, closing of the loops and also very locally 
uh, recycling or cycling materials and, and water flows. At the same time, we also really wanted to focus on the food provisioning of this area because as we understand the food system is a very impactful one. So we created an aquaponic system where we find a symbiotic relationship between plants and fishes, where the fish uh, are fed with uh, larvae which are grown on the food waste from the local cafes. These fish uh, excrement feces and these feces are then used to fertilize or feed the plants uh, uh, in the in the greenhouse here on top of these two houseboats and then these these plants can be used in our cafe again to really locally focus on what a sustainable food a food system and a decentralized size a decentralized food system uh, could look like and that brings us to the next part because next to all the technical interventions and all this the technical uh, sustainability aspects we also find it very important to use this place as a social hub for interaction so what how can we not only experiment with sustainability, but how can we also showcase other people what sustainability looks like and what the sustainable city of the future could look like? Uh, we created the Keuvel Café here, which is now in uh, summer a very popular place for people all of, uh, around Amsterdam, English in the Netherlands uh, to come to. And we use this place not only for people to have a good time, but also to, on a very low barrier way, show them what sustainability and sustainable development uh, could look like. And based on this whole uh, layout, we can see all these different houseboats where uh, social uh, enterprises are being placed. And then here we have uh, the greenhouse where we grow, grow our own plants. And then we have the Keuvel, which is the cafe. And as you can see, not all houseboats have the same amount of solar panels on them. And uh, there's a reason for that. And why we did that is because of the orientation and the vegetation of these houseboats, not all of them were fit for solar panels. And then we thought it was kind of weird that some boats would have sustainable energy and some would not. And so we tried to think of a system to really exchange this energy. And we quickly found that was very difficult with current legislation. So what we then did is we uh, made our own company, uh, Spectral, uh, which worked on the Juliet. And the Juliet is a Bitcoin system which allows these boats to exchange energy without the interference of a third party. So it happens automatically. If one boat needs, one boat needs energy, uh, where another one has a surplus, this exchange is done automatically. And by doing so, they, uh, the inhabitants can earn Bitcoins. And these Bitcoins can then be used in the local cafe to also stimulate a sustainable, uh, the sustainable economy that we want to create uh, on a very local, uh, local basis. So of course, uh, understanding this showcase of new productive society, it's very experimental and it's very uh, about discovering what this could look like. And then based on what we learned here, we really thought it was important to not just leave it at the curl, but to scale it up to make sure that we can increase the knowledge that we have to a, to a larger scale. So what we did is that we worked in the transformation of our neighborhoods. And the, the neighborhood surrounding the curl is called Bijksloterham. And we worked with a large consortium of partners on creating a manifest for what Bijksloterham uh, should look like. What is the circular future of area development and how can we, as a whole group of partners, actually create this, uh, this area development? And then based on this manifest, we wrote uh, guidelines on how this neighborhood should be developed. And one of the projects that actually came out of this neighborhood development is Schoonschip. Schoonschip, a uh, literal translation would mean clean ship. And it is uh, designed to be the most sustainable floating uh, community in the world, at least in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. And what we did there is work together through a very in intensive stakeholder process together with the people who were living, well, would be living here based on material flows relevant for this area, and also the impacts that would be generated after building this community. We, we went through a very thorough uh, design process with a lot of different architects uh, before making and now, and also uh, finalizing this, this floating neighborhood. And what's actually really nice is that based on, on what we learned from the Keuvel and how uh, all the experiment that we did there, we could actually find a way to, to directly implement it again and grow and learn again. And by in this way, create an incremental growth of what sustainability and sustainable development uh, and circular development uh, looks like. And I think that's also very important to mention that it's here again, it's also about material reuse and sustainable materials, but it's also very much about the material flows in the use phase of a building. So one of the interventions based on Juliet and the spectral work that we did is actually a smart community platform where we took this technology one step further, implemented batteries and where we allowed the different stakeholders and the different parties within the Schoonschip community to exchange energy uh, with each other. 
uh, on, a, on a very intensive basis to create a very independent and self-sufficient uh, neighborhood. That actually, now that it's done, it looks like this. So it's a very uh, nice, child-friendly uh, place to live. Uh, you can swim in the canal and it's uh, really a new place within the city of Amsterdam where, uh, where we're trying to work on what sustainable building of the future uh, could look like. Of course, that's not there. We th then we thought, okay, this is really nice, but how can we take this again one step further? And we looked at a larger scale. So how does the city of Amsterdam work? What flows are relevant there? And how can we interact and, and change, interchange between these two? And also how can we find the right tools to really create this incremental change on a larger scale. So based on what we learned at, at the Keuvel and at Schoonschip, we wrote tendering guidelines. And we, we created a roadmap for circular land tendering from the, for the municipality of Amsterdam. Uh, in 2017, we did the first tr trials uh, with this. And now, uh, because it uh, succeeded so well, we, it's a part of the, 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 the the policy of the municipality of Amsterdam for every new project that they start to really critically think about what local flows are there, uh, how can we uh, use a synergy to create a more sustainable area development, and how can we really create and uh, implement the findings that we did on a very small scale uh, on, on, a, on a much larger scale. Um, yeah, so that's the, the whole aspect of incremental growth and using um, small-scale experimentation to really change the effect of cities and, and larger uh, larger ecosystems. That was a very bottom-up approach. And then the other approach that I would like to talk to you about is uh, the more top-down approach of taking solutions from a city scale and, and implementing them. So what we did uh, and what I would like to talk about uh, in this project is the city of Rotterdam. Uh, it's, of course, very interesting because it's the sister city of uh, Baltimore. Um, yeah, so what we did for the city of uh, Rotterdam is that we mapped all the material flows going in and out of the city on a yearly basis. That means all the energy that's being used, electricity, gas, uh, different types of fuels, all agri-food, so all the food that is being consumed, all consumer goods, all building materials, and all hospital medicines, because they also have a very big impact. And then on the outflow, we can visualize what emissions are generated by the city what types of waste, what type of mineral waste, and what uh, waste types of waste water. But more importantly, where is this waste currently going? So is it being downcycled? Is it being recycled? Is it being burned? Or is it being landfilled? And based on that, we can say, okay, now that we understand, we can put very clear and understandable goals to make the system more sustainable. As a zoom in of this analysis, we also looked at the building sector for Rotterdam and what we could see that there's a lot of building materials going into the city. And there's also a lot of uh, demolition waste coming out of the city. So we could see on the inflow, we see a big part of it is concrete. And then we have uh, brick, uh, ceramic wood, steel. Also all the energy needed for construction. So the diesel and the petrol for the building machines and then split over uh, what part is used for the construction sector, the renovation sector, and then of course, all the materials coming out of the demolition sector. And again, we think it's very important to understand not just the, what waste, but also where is this waste going? So it's down cycled, it's incinerated, or it's recycled. And here we can see that in the construction sector in the Netherlands, a lot of the material that's coming out of the demolition project is being pulverized and put as filling underneath roads. And of course, that's better than putting it uh, in a landfill, but it would be much better to um, Uh, to do uh, to do something with the highest value possible. So this really ties into the, the graphs that we showed. We can recycle it, but that's actually the, the, uh, taking away a lot of the value of the material. If we can find a way to repurpose it or reuse it with the same level of quality, we actually retain much more of the value of the material and therefore also create less environmental impact if we need new materials. So when we look at the, the built environment, we can really see that uh, we have been investing in a built environment over many decades, and it's actually a lot of value that we're putting in these buildings. And in the current system, we in invest a lot of these values, but then in in invest a lot of this value, but then at the end of the life of these buildings, all this value is being destroyed. And that means that the current value in our system is not uh, leveraged in the, in the right way. 
So what we did for the city of Rotterdam, we did not only look at the demolition flow, so the material, but we also predicted where this uh, material would actually be freed. And what we did is we looked at all the demolition and construction projects over uh, the next 10 years, uh, where we said, uh, where we assessed them not only on their scale, but also on their location. So here on this map, you can see all the red dots. Those are demolition projects. The green dots are building projects and the size of the bubble is related to the amount of square meters that will re be realized and therefore also has a direct consequence on the amount of material that is needed. Based on, on this map, we can see, uh, understand what, we can get a much more clearer grasp of, of what's, what will happen over the next few uh, years. So we could see that there were over 229 demolition projects until 2030, but over 4,000 new construction projects until 2030. Uh, with uh, their respective amount of buildings and um, um, amount of square uh, areas that uh, will need to be renovated. And then based on this map, we could see, okay, what is the most interesting part to intervene in, in this system? So we could see that there, we, we then made a top 10 of the most interesting projects where we could uh, retain 65% of all materials that would be liberated out of the urban mine for the next uh, 10 years, where we can see um, and then divide it very clearly over different types of projects. So for instance, 77% of the housing projects are, uh, the housing projects are um, responsible for 77% of all the materials. There's a lot of commercial real estate projects. There's some social real estate. And then based on these data, we could see, okay, so it gives us a much clearer understanding of where in the system we need to intervene if we want to have the biggest impact instead of just tackling each uh, renovation project on an individual basis. Oh, yeah. So again, also thinking about uh, reuse instead of um, uh, recycling. It's if we want to reuse, we also need to think about uh, materials at their um, as a product and not just at a, as a material flow. So what we did based on this pro project, we mapped all the doors, the window frames, the wooden beams, like, and, and this is just an, an overview. Um, what product would become free during this renovation process so that we could have very clear guidelines and also tendering guidelines to, to reintroduce these materials. And at the same time, also understand what infrastructure we would need to make sure that these materials could be reused at their highest value. Because of course, taking a material out of a building is one step, but also having the infrastructure in place to make sure that we can reuse it is maybe also uh, as important. <clears throat> So based on that, we can see that like we mapped all the, the flows cumulat cumulatively, where we can see that concrete, so uh, button in Dutch, is actually a very pre uh, prevalent flow, but also see in what year a lot of concrete would actually become available from the urban mine to make sure that the policy and the building projects that would need this concrete are actually very, uh, can be planned accordingly. Then based on these uh, flows, we can also look not only, we, we again took a look at the, at the products. So for instance, here we made an overview of all products. And there we looked first at the mass that is relevant, that is, that is tied to all these products. So for instance, here, the, the bottom one is uh, wooden beams. And we can see that wooden beams is actually uh, responsible for a very large part of the mass. But then, of course, from a systems pr perspective and from a sustainability perspective, it's not just about reusing mass, it's also about preventing impacts from happening. So we can see here the impact. We can see that wooden beams, even though they are a big part of the mass, they are a much smaller part of the total impact, the environmental impact being generated. And at the same time, because we understand that the building sector is very conservative uh, and also is a very money-driven sector, we need to understand how much value is tied to these, uh, to these beams. So we see here, for instance, that the beams are not, are a huge, um, material flow have less impact and even less value. Whereas uh, this yellow bar, which is the insulation material, is relatively slow in mass, uh, as a relatively slow mass, but have a, has a very big environmental impact. So if you want to mitigate as much impact as possible with the, the least amount of effort, we should say, okay, then focus on the environmental impact uh, of, of insulation material and really recycling those at the highest value. At the same time, we can see that, and again, the financial value is really slow or low. So therefore we need to think really critically and smartly about how is it possible? How can we create these financial incentives to do so? Of course, uh, there's a lot of 
potential issues being tied to material reuse. So what we did here is we defined six, uh, five parameters, which um, can make the, the reuse of material harder. Uh, so that is a standardized sizing, the, the risk of pollution within the material, the effort to process, the, the performance that is needed to actually make sure that the material can be reused and how easy it is to disassemble it uh, on gen in a general uh, manner. And by doing that, we can uh, better understand how we need to tackle the problem of urban mining and what tools we need to do it as effectively as possible. So based on that and all these flows, we can also start looking at um, closing the loop and also optimizing between both the environmental impact that we have and the economic and environmental distance thresholds. So looking at the materials that would come available from the urban mine, we can then see, okay, how would the chain within the Netherlands actually deal with this material? Is the chain or the value chain already in place or do we need to invest in it to make sure that it's happening locally to prevent a lot of uh, emissions from transportation, from transporting this material all over the Netherlands? By doing that and really understanding how these value chains work and what stakeholders are uh, present and, and relevant, we could work on um, an urban mining hub. So what we did there is based on the projects that we mapped and all the new projects uh, relevant in, in the municipality of Rotterdam, we created a spatial analysis where we said, based on both the material, the processing demands and the transportation distances, this would be the most optimal place to build place this building hub because and also tied to the, the, the potential um, renovation or uh, repair strategies that are needed to, to, to reuse this material. What could we actually do on this scale uh, within the city boundaries uh, also based on legislative and uh, environmental parameters. So, um, and by doing so, yeah, we can uh, understand, we can start to create an understanding what it would entail to, to work with, with, with urban mining strategies and what it would entail to to work on um, closing material loops on a small scale or even on a, on a city scale, because not all materials are fit for that. Some materials uh, can be recycled on a very uh, small scale. For instance, uh, window frames are relatively easy to, to repair, even though uh, time intensive. Whereas, for instance, steel, the, the repair of steel beams or even the recycling of steel beams actually requires a lot of energy and a lot of scale. So maybe that's not the best way to go forward uh, within the city. So taking all this knowledge and all this, these parameters and all these different types of approaching the circular system, I wanted to walk through uh, unlocking the potential of the circular economy. So what do we need to do differently in the, in the system that we're currently facing? And first, I would like to, 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 uh, to address the way architects uh, can change the way they work. And I think the first thing is to really think about a new set of design strategies. So um, when we understand the impact that we are creating within a project or the material use that we are create, uh, that, that is necessary to, to generate our, um, to, to create our projects, we need to apply these four strategies. So first of all, it's to reduce these impact as much as possible. Uh, if uh, that has been done, uh, then we can look for synergies. So what local material flows are, are available that I can use to actually implement in my project to further, again, reduce the environmental impact. If both of these are exhausted, we can really think of uh, sustainable purchasing. So if new material is needed, how can I purchase it with the least environmental impact or the least impact yeah, on, on, the, on the area around me? And then the final one is management. So once my project is there and once I've installed everything, how can I make sure that I learn from it and not just I, but the sector as a whole, and how can we kind of create this incremental growth that we've been talking about with the curve? How can we use the knowledge that we are generating to change the building sector from the bottom up? To make that a bit more concrete, I can give some examples. So a very nice project that I think has been realized recently is the, it's called Research Rose. It's in Copenhagen where they used old brick walls from nearby uh, buildings that were being demolished and they cut out these, these uh, brick walls and then immediately, immediately used them to create a new facade. So of course, bricks are very hard to reuse because they are um, mortared together. Uh, and by using them in this way, we don't have to pulverize them and put them under a road, but we can actually use them for what they are best fit, which is be a facade. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and so this is very much tied into the understanding of reusing the material at the highest value possible. 
another one would be a um, waste street, a waste collection point in The Hague, where uh, two arch architects, super use architects in Wessel van Geve, uh, created this facade of old waste cutting. So there's a nearby um, metal plant which uses sheets, standardized sheets to cut out standardized components. And in the end, there's always a lot of scrap metal left over. And so we can melt this and create something new out of it or we can really use it as a component to, to create a facade that's very interesting, also as a high architectural uh, uh, value, to my, uh, to my opinion. It really focuses not only on reducing the waste that would be generated in the process of the metal cutting plant, but also really working with the local material flows that are, are present near uh, this uh, waste collection point. And kind of building on top of that, it's uh, very interesting to also think about how we can change the design process. So how we usually design a building is we first make a design, <laughs> then we finalize the design, then we buy all the materials and we build a building. But understanding what material is present is, has, of course, a very high impact on what your building will look like. So therefore, the super use company, the architects that we just discussed, created a new way of designing. So it would be first understanding what is there, make a schematic design, get a thorough understanding of the materials that you that are potentially being there, be freed in the from the urban mine, create this harvest map, find like create a more uh, final design, shop your building's materials, but really harvest it, go get out into the world and, and, and grab it from the urban mine, and then create a dynamic construction uh, where these materials can be implemented. Of course, then the building is realized, and then afterwards you can really start thinking about what impact have I just saved by reusing these materials. And as you understand, to do this, it is very important to really understand what materials are present in the urban mine. And that's also, I think, where a lot of the, the previous work that we've been doing in Rotterdam is, is very essential. Another one that I think is very important is understanding the impact of renovation. So when we think of buildings that are already there, very often they are being demolished. Uh, I don't know what the actual data are uh, from the, uh, the United States, but I know in the Netherlands, on average, buildings last have a lifespan of 40 to 70 years, uh, and then they're being demolished. Um, but if we think about how we can reuse these buildings to the best of their ability, it's interesting to think about, for instance, how we can reuse the, the, the foundation, the structure. It's not only uh, relevant for 80% of the mass of the building, but also 60% of the environmental impact, and usually has a very, very long lifespan, up to 300 years. So understanding how we can transform buildings better and also actively steering towards it is, is a very important strategy also in the reducing of the environmental impact of your projects. At the same time, it's also interesting about the products, so like the finishing that you use in a building. It's only two to 5% of a building, but it has 12 to 15, uh, 12 to 25% of the impact of the building is, relevant, uh, is, is attached to it. So on the one hand, really make sure that you leave as much of the construction and the foundation there. And at the other hand, really understand the impact that is being generated if you put on a new facade and try to make that one as minimal as possible as well. A project that, where that has been done is the Aliander headquarters in Duivitz, done by Rau Architects. Uh, and what they did is they took the old head office, which is uh, the top building, and they used over, uh, they reused over 93% of all the materials. Um, so as you can see, they uh, designed a, an overarching structure, which is a very light metal structure. Uh, and then uh, all the buildings that are there had a, uh, got a new facade made from waste wood. And uh, what's quite nice about this project is that not only steered very much on the reuse of building material, but also very much focused on the well being and the health of the, uh, and also the connection that the different departments of this company would have to each other. So they created all these air bridges and on all these air bridges are here for instance you can see the meeting spaces but they also put all uh, the copying machines and all the functions needed to do some uh, stuff like that they put them on the bridges so the departments would have to come together and also a get up more and walk a bit around but also really meet each other and understand get a better grasp of, of what other uh, departments within the company are doing so i think that's also a very nice example of uh, taking a broader look than just sustainability, but also really understanding how you can redesign social sustainability. Another strategy would be to learn from natural systems. So we can really understand if we can apply the way nature constructs itself, we can very much reduce uh, the amount of material we'll need. A good example is this case study that's been done by the ETH in Zurich, 
where they developed a new concrete slab which would reduce 70% of the weight compared to a regular concrete slab by uh, at applying constructive methods, constructive methods that have been uh, based on biomimicry principles. So really understanding how nature constructs itself and how we can actually create more or better advanced buildings to, to incorporate the strategies. This is a very material oriented uh, topic, but there's a, a whole area because a lot of uh, ways you can go about this. One would be, for instance, thinking of natural ventilation systems. Um, so really understanding how nature works and implementing that in a more thorough scale in our buildings is also very important to reduce the environmental impact we have. And at the same time, uh, we can also work with materials that have a very minimal impact. This is a tower uh, that has been based solely on uh, mycelium material, which is a, a mushroom-based material uh, which can be grown locally based on um, both a mycelium, so a, a mushroom, but also on an aggregate that can be uh, basically anything that has a, uh, with, with, yeah, a, fibrous, um, a fibrous material. So this is a, an, a pavilion that's very much uh, focused on exemplary um, uh, uh, function, but uh, of course, strategies like these can be uh, implemented further as because mycelium does not only have a very nice uh, constructive <laughs> um, purpose, but also is a very good insulating for, uh, purpose, which you could then, for instance, use to replace the insulation material that we found uh, has a very high embodied impact in the, in the urban mining scan that we previously discussed. And then from the management perspective, I think it's very important to also really understand what materials are there in the buildings. So now we worked, of course, on this urban mining model that we use to predict material flows. But if we document the materials that we have in a building, we can uh, do these analyses much more thorough and much get a much better understanding of the potential value of these material chains. Um, I put here an image of Thomas Rau, uh, which is one of the founders of Madaster, which will also be one of the lectures that you will uh, shortly visit. So I highly uh, suggest uh, listening to it very carefully because it's an interesting uh, approach. So to summarize, it's very important to renovate and repair where possible, try to keep the material at the highest, highest level of the value chain, reuse buildings uh, and, and use local buildings uh, materials as much as possible, find materials with low embodied impact and document materials you have so that the future generations can use them as well. At the same time, um, I also want to think about, I want to, want to kind of uh, take you on a journey of how city governments or more uh, governmental layers can uh, work on unlocking the potential of circular economy. So first of all, it's getting um, an understanding of how the current system works. As we can see right now is that reuse of circular building material is very complex and costly, and that the quantity and quality of the supply is very unpredictable. So as a government investigating this, uh, the, the urban mine of your city and also sharing this knowledge with local parties is essential to make sure that we can start reusing these materials at a larger scale. At the same time, creating the infrastructure that is needed to, to reuse material is a second step and that is also very needed to make sure that the material doesn't end up in, uh, in the landfill. So uh, the, the investment that is needed to do this uh, is often the, one of the biggest barriers of actually making sure that these material flows are uh, up and running. Because once these material flows and these, these investments are being done, the business case for circular economy is very easily made. And there's a lot of uh, potential upsides to reusing the material and also not just environmental, but also financial. But to get, go to get going on this, it's very important that, that someone takes the first step and uh, we think that city governments are in the, the best position uh, to at least be a partner uh, to do so. At the same time, it's important to really put ambitious goals so that the sectors that you work with, especially the building sector, know how to, how to innovate. <clears throat> so make ambitious policy goals based, based on what's feasible uh, and decide what's feasible based on what's present in your urban mind. And then at the same time, also provide the space to harvest and process these materials within, uh, within the urban context to make sure that future construction and demolition processes are uh, actually uh, uh, as, as circular and sustainable as possible. And finally, I think it's important to use your own property and your own, your own project that you're developing as example projects to make sure that you can show the, the building sector and show 
uh, different parties that it can be done, even though it will require some research uh, and, uh, and some additional effort. So this is a quite a nice uh, project. It's a the city hall in Venlo, which is a Dutch city, which has been completely designed towards the cradle to cradle philosophy. So it can be completely demounted. It's designed for optimal uh, natural light to enter and has a natural ventilation system, which is run through the solar chimney on top. All materials that are used have, are, are healthy materials and have minimized environmental impact. And as I also said, it, like, it's completely designed to be disassembled so that if this building were ever to be removed, uh, all components could be used at the highest value uh, possible from a circular perspective. Another one that I would like to address is the headquarters from the EU. Uh, it's uh, a building that on one hand has an existing component. So this is a, a building that was already there. And this whole atrium has been built and constructed from existing window frames from uh, all European member states. So next to it being a very um, poetical and uh, building, it also really shows that the reuse of materials at a high value is possible, uh, even though some frameworks need to be uh, put in place to actually make sure that it uh, happens. So to conclude, uh, for city governments, it's important to create insight into the potential of the urban mine and facilitate the infrastructure to reuse these materials, create legislation and financial incentives to push for sustainable innovation, share knowledge on innovation and become an active participant in implementation, and also give the right example by using your own building projects to showcase what is possible in the sustainable uh, built environment of the future. That was my presentation, <laughs> our presentation. Are there any? questions. Thank you, Nico and Andrew, for this presentation. A necessary and loud message stimulating all of us to start implementing a circular process immediately. So panelists, please join Nico, Andrew, and myself by turning your cameras on, please. Students and all attendees, you're invited to ask your questions to Nico and Andrew. Please raise your hand to ask a question verbally by clicking raise hand button right there. Or um, add your question to the chat or Q&A window to share your concerns. Jeremiah, can you please go ahead and share the collected questions with Nico and Andrew at this point, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first question states, uh, Baltimore and Amsterdam are an affluent global north economies. How are these circular economy ideas practiced working in the less affluent global south? Um, I'll start this one and maybe pass it off to Nico again. Um, it's a good question. In many parts of the Global South, uh, circular economy practices have been the norm before the Global North imposed our forms of economy and uh, urban planning on them. Um, so it, there's many informal versions of it currently happening. In terms of applying sort of circular city, uh, highly technical versions of it, like what we're working on here in Amsterdam. Uh, in the Global South, uh, we are currently working in Porto Alegre in Brazil on um, understanding the role of a school, a uh, school building in its neighborhood, the resources it takes in and how it serves as a resource bank uh, and hub of, of consumption. Um, that is working through the, through ICLE and its action fund. It's a consortium of uh, the network of local governments worldwide. Um, we are also doing some work in Southeast Asia, but they are primarily focused on stemming the flow of uh, municipal waste rather than looking at construction waste yet. Um, and I think there's been quite a bit of work on bio-based materials, um, so alternative building materials rather than design for deconstruction. Um, Nico, I'm not sure if you know of more circular economy work for the built environment in the global south, but um, this is how I've seen it so far. Uh, no, I think that that pretty much sums it up. It's of course very interesting, uh, especially uh, when we talk about vernacular ar architecture and working with local building materials that uh, a lot of the building materials that we have been producing, such as concrete, are now uh, pushing vernacular architecture out. So working with uh, local stakeholders in the global south to really make sure that on the one hand, this vernacular way of building uh, is being preserved. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, reusing the materials that are there as much as possible is, is very key. Uh, it's 
unfortunately still in the pipeline for us as a company to actively start to start doing so yeah i know that um several networks there's a, a a network in africa footprints africa is doing uh collecting sort of circular economy projects from across uh i think sub-saharan africa um sort of have more peer-to-peer -peer learning and distribution of knowledge okay um i'll go to the next question uh, it states, how sustainable and feasible is it, for instance, if one wants to relocate the house from Skanskip to somewhere else? Is it possible? Also, were there any disaster analysis taken into account while building it on the water? Uh, I can I can answer this one, Andrew. Um, yeah, so it would be possible to relocate. Of course, then uh, if someone else would join the community, would need to join the community, the, the houseboat that would need to join would be also, would need to be constructed in a way that it would fit within the, the energy system and the, the exchange of materials that are uh, an integral part of the, of, the, of the design process, but it would be possible to relocate. And the, the risk assessment, uh, yes, it was taken into account. I think it's also good to mention that uh, the Netherlands has a very long-standing history of building on the water. Uh, a lot of the canals in uh, Amsterdam and also neighboring cities are used as uh, to, to build houseboats on. And then of course, there's still the imminent risk of, of water within uh, the Netherlands, the water rising. And therefore uh, building these houseboats, you actually are more adept to deal with these uh, global, uh, global climate warming challenges that uh, that have that are pressuring uh, the part of the Netherlands that's below the sea level. So um, yes, for sure, it's been taken into account. Okay, I can move on to the next question. Um, are there any precedents to a Bitcoin mining community? I really love the idea and would like to see or know more examples of how to make architecture generate something so tangible and infinitely abstract as money. Um, yes, for that, I would like to um, at, uh, for I don't know if I forgot the word. I th one of our com <laughs> our company, Spectral, is uh, on a continuous basis working on, on these types of communities. So uh, I can send the link uh, to Christina and Rachel and maybe they can forward it to you. Uh, then it's their company page and they work on a, on a, a very large area, uh, like a different range of projects uh, concerning this specific topic. Yeah, I will, I'll add in. So... Uh, Metabolic has that those five entities that form Metabolic as an ecosystem, but we also spun off uh, another company focused specifically on energy called Spectral Energy. They were originally doing uh, mobile uh, renewable energy generation. Uh, think of like a, a mobile uh, solar power transformer that can be brought to festivals or campsites or whatever it is. They now do really high tech building management systems and energy trading systems. Um, on the building, neighborhood, and city level uh, that are managing uh, sort of trading of energy between uh, distributed producers. So if you think of every building as a producer in the city, um, real-time trading of stored energy versus energy demand, um, or real-time selling back into the grid at the, at the optimal price point. Um, so that is definitely happening. Uh, Spectral is front and center on that. They were also the ones who helped us sort of design the Juliet system at uh, De Keuvel. And uh, we're seeing this being built into a lot of uh, usually neighborhood level uh, developments um, or campus level developments. We have multiple entities, multiple buildings um, that can be trading resources between them. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next is more of a critique uh, aimed at the Danish example building. Uh, it states reused brick was used yet it came with high impact met metal construction. So would you like to, what's your take on it? Or would you like to explain it? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, 
Uh, yes, there was a high metal um, impact on the, on the reuse of this in this facade. Um, I think overall, when uh, so the, the overall environment embedded impact of this project, so comparing it to a, a normal case of a, of a regularly built project, still was significant, significantly lower uh, than, uh, yeah, so it was significantly lower. And in the construction of this process, the design for this assembly measures to actually take this building apart and re reuse both the brick component and the steel component were taken into account to make sure that um, the, the in fu for future use, these, these building materials would not be uh, wasted. So ideally, it, there would, have, would not have been uh, a high impact steel structure, but it did facilitate an overall project that had a lower environmental impact than, than, a, than a regular building. So in that sense, I do think understanding the environmental impact uh, on a larger scale and steering projects in the direction uh, is, uh, is the way to go. <laughs> Uh, even though not uh, there is not the perfect project uh, out there yet, so um, it's a it's a balancing act of uh, where we need to always be conscious of the of the impacts that we are generating. Okay, um, the next one I think uh, uh, Andrew uh, commented on. But is, is there any plan to create a marketplace in Amsterdam for reuse? construction materials. A company here in Quebec is building something like this. I think uh, it's called Biz, Biz Share. So um, yes, the, I can answer that live so everyone can hear if that's helpful. Um, the, the short answer is yes, there, that is happening. Uh, we are working on building these sort of communities of practice around urban mining across the Netherlands. Um, as an individual city, Rotterdam is probably more advanced on that than Amsterdam. Um, with actually citing uh, a, a transfer station as sort of a circular construction hub um, and beginning to uh, build a community practice around changing policies so that, that it's actually reflected in their construction. Um, we also see on a larger scale, the northern half of the Netherlands, the three provinces that make up the North Netherlands are also building a community of practice around circular construction that includes private and public sector stakeholders. Um, we do see a key bit changing here is that the, the public sector is willing to put this into uh, tendering guidelines or RFPs. They require a certain amount of secondary material to be used. Um, and then uh, that provides the sort of kick in the pants to, to get the community of practice going. Okay, next question says, can you talk a little about the comparison between traditional and circular techniques and how the finance of the two compare. We as responsible humans see the value. However, I can't see some developers being a harder sell. Uh, I can start this and Nika, if you want to get more technical than I can, we can go with that. Um, in general, um, the sort of design for disassembly is seen as an investment in the future value of the building. When you demolish a building, its value goes to essentially nothing. And this is that value hill. And so as a sort of pitch, rather than if you're talking to the developers, um, you're telling them that it, you're, they're selling a more valuable building to the, the building owners because the building owners will have something more than rubble to sell at the end of the project. If the, if the building is at its end of life, um, using something like a material passport, you can pick out the value of all the materials in there uh, and find a reseller for them, uh, for example, in a marketplace like what we're developing here in the Netherlands. Um, so that's one way to sort of show where the extra value comes from. Um, we also uh, have the added value of regulatory pressure here in the EU um, with uh, significant regulations coming down on construction sector and its uh, greenhouse gas emissions and environmental impact through the EU Green Deal. Um, so this is a sort of get out of jail uh, method for those developers. Uh, Nico's uh, much more up close and personal with this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think the main issue for in, 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 in generating value within um, circular construction and the reuse of materials, the topic of ownership. So who owns this material and who does the value belong to? 
So initially, how the current building system works is that there's a very segmented approach. So you build something, then you sell it, then you own something, then you sell it, and then somebody destroys it, and then the rubble is, uh, has, has no value. Whereas if a different type of ownership where the, the, the company uh, who is initially investing in the material also owns it, it can generate a, a very interesting and a lot of added, uh, added value. A good example, I think, of this is the Circle Pavilion in Amsterdam. It's been created by the ABN AMRO. And for this building, the construction, uh, the beams, the wooden beams that are in this building are actually still owned by uh, the company who produced them. And they produced them in a way, so they, they dimensioned them for the, the construction span that they need to make. And then they made them a bit bigger on all sides. Uh, why did they do this? So that if this pavilion, which will be either will stay there forever and then that's fine and they just have an asset that's there or will be uh, dismantled which means that they will get their beams back and then they have this beam <laughs> which is a bit too big on all sides for the span that it needs to make and they did it so that they could resend the beam and actually still have the structural capacity and give it a nice and new appearance so that it can be reused at, as, a, as a new beam basically so I think within the current system, we are talking very much about a segmented approach and to really understand the value we need to think of, of longer lines and of ownership. And of course, that's not easy. And that's also part of a transition, but it is, uh, there is a lot of value to be generated, especially if you just think about, uh, instead of putting uh, money on the bank, putting a building material in a building, if you get it back over a certain amount of time and you can still reuse it at the same value, but then maybe uh, because of inflation, building materials have become more valuable, then it's not such a weird uh, comparison. Another thing, another way of thinking about it, and I think that's very interesting for sustainability interventions, such as solar panels or water cycling systems, is that you can start competing with the, um, the annual fee that you have to start paying for energy. So yes, if you put solar panels on your building, it will require a larger investment. But if then for 25 years, which is the average life of a solar panel, you can every year earn money because you don't have to pay energy, your energy bill, but you can actually ask the inhabitants of your building complex to pay you a certain fee. You can have a return on investment that based on Dutch energy prices. So I don't know how representative this would be for the, for the American sector could already be within two, two to five years. So uh, it's again, thinking differently about investment and, and payback trajectories, where now we, we have the very segmented approach. If we take a more uh, a longer term, and I have, a, have a, a longer term horizon in, in mind, and also have different types of commitment and ownership models, there's actually a lot of money to be made with, uh, with sustainability and uh, sustainable interventions. Thank you, Nico and Andrew. We have four more questions left. If it's okay for all, this lecture will run slightly later than originally planned, 2.20 or 6, 7.20, uh, to allow enough time for Q&A. So if it's okay, Jeremiah, please go ahead and uh, state the question. Hey, thank you. Um, the next question is the concept of circular economy is still evolving and emerging. Is there a mechanism to quantify the risk associated with transition to circular economy? For example, warranty, uh, financial risk? That is definitely one of the, the challenges at the moment. Um, more of where we are, what we're seeing a lot of the work coming into play is uh, creating the enabling conditions for a circular economy. So just like Nico was saying, the, the big challenge uh, in buildings was the, the question of ownership. Um, similarly becomes the question when you're setting up circular business models. And right now it's sort of being worked out on a case by case basis. Uh, I don't know if there is uh, a particular mechanism for it. I also don't know if I, I haven't heard of an overarching uh, mechanism or institute who is assessing this risk. I do think that the risk of not doing a circular economy is very uh, apparent and should also be part of this uh, equation if it's uh, if it's ever done. Yeah, there's lots of lots of work being done on the financial risk of of business as usual. 
yeah. um, the value at risk, the, the sort of long-term devastation that will be wrought. Yeah. Um, in terms of warranty, I mean, the, one of the things that's interesting about circular business models, so like, for example, the steel company that made the beams for the, the pavilion that Nico was talking about, is that that sort of business model, or Philips, for example, with their lighting as a service in Schiphol Airport, uh, instead of selling light bulbs, they sell sort of hours of certain amounts of light. Uh, and then the incentive financially within the business is to make a product that is as durable and reliable as possible so that you don't have to go in there and repair it and replace it um, and that it actually has value for you when a contract ends. Um, so the idea is that you're switching the incentive structure away from planned obsolescence, which I think we're all very frustrated with by now in our cars and our phones and everything else, uh, and uh, towards uh, making quality goods that last a longer time. Okay, hey, uh, the next question is, what projects do you have in Latin America? Do you have any projects expected in Colombia? Um, we are currently working together with uh, ICLI, the partner that uh, Andrew mentions on a project in Brazil. Uh, it's on the renovation and energy performance of a group of schools in a community center. Um, so that's the one I'm working on currently. <laughs> that's uh, it. We, metabolic. Um, yeah, we don't have anything in Colombia yet, but I, we would love to. So if you uh, want to reach out and start a project with us, we would be more than happy to uh, to talk about that. Uh, okay. The next question is um, in regards to De Sovel. Do you you stated that plants were removed after? Uh, functioning as a purifying agent, how are they disposed of? They are treated as chemical wastes because by that point they almost are. Um, they are filled with the heavy metals and the chemicals from the ground and therefore need to be uh, treated with a lot of care. Yeah. So not very circular. They were not recycling them, unfortunately, but we are using them to take toxins out of the ecosystem. So in that sense... Uh, Restorative rather than pure. restorative. Yeah. Okay. Um, a participant would like to ask a question verbally, so we're gonna give him the mic to speak. Um. M C H, can you unmute your mic? I'm sorry, MCH, but we can't hear you. So please go ahead and put your question in the chat. And I'm sorry, in the Q&A window for us. It looks like you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Okay, I can move on to the next question that we have. Um, it says the development of Suvel and the Birkenslaham project seems rather rapid. As compared to how long a development project could take within the construction sector, what do you think was the key for these projects to get developed at this pace that they did? I think the small scale played a tremendous role. So um, because we worked with a lot of existing materials, uh, if I take the curve as a departure point, like. Uh, in the curve, we worked with a lot of existing materials with the houseboats, which means that that already cut a lot of construction time. And we tried to do a very low, low tech, small scale uh, experimentation approach, which meant that uh, uh, a lot of the legislation processes, which also take a lot of time, were steered around. <laughs> um, I think that would be the main aspect of why the curve went so rapidly. It was part of a competition with the goal to be there at a certain point in time. So, and it was a very small scale project. So therefore we pushed it to be um, as quickly as possible. And then Buikslotterham and Schoonschip, uh, the project there that also took quite some while. Uh, it, uh, it has been recently 
uh, delivered and we've been working on it almost in, we almost immediately started on it after the Keuvel so it's been there for it's been in the process uh, in the books for, for quite some time and Baxter to home as an area is still under full development so our office is in uh, is in the, in the neighborhood and we can see the cranes and the building uh, happening uh, on a continuous basis so it's uh, <laughs> that's the one not done uh, by far but also allows us to to reevaluate some of the things we decided on earlier if they are how effective they are in in practice once once uh, once they are being executed so that's also quite interesting yeah i, I would only add that um the the Kerbal and chromship are both on on sites that weren't in uh particularly high demand or had other uses already so uh the Kerbal was a highly polluted brownfield that sat that they were planning to develop before 2008 and then uh, 2008 hit, and then it sat vacant for several years until the community complained about it sitting vacant. Um, and so then there is, uh, the, uh, Amsterdam has this program where they will put sites like that up for these competitions where they set certain performance criteria. Um, and so they had an incentive to sort of move it through uh, and, and show that it was a success. And, and of course, Schoenschip is, is built on the water. There wasn't any competing land use there. Um, I think that definitely helped. Uh, thank you, uh, Nico and Andrew. I believe that was the last question for you guys. So I'm just going to pass the mic to Christina now. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you, Nico and Andrew. So before concluding, uh, we have something from the audience, and I quote, this is truly one of the best, most valuable webinars I have been on this uh, in this year, this last year. I love how you are going straight to tangible, not leaving it theoretical. So on this note, I think we shall wrap up this relevant session. All panelists, please put yourself in mute mode if not done so already. Thank you everybody for attending this lecture and we hope it was a significant message and encouragement to never stop exploring and proposing new design by using circular economy, of course. Please note that this lecture is part of a larger lecture series uh, this semester. On April the 7th, we're gonna have a um, Tentatively, um, Madaster will talk about material passport. And on the 15th of April at 3.30 Eastern time, 9.30 PM Central time, European, April de Simone and Redline in America, how city have been structurally segregated following ethnicity. We are um, announcing them on the Baltimore Rotterdam Committee social media and on uh, email announcement. Um, in an email announcement we'll send to everybody that has registered on Eventbrite. Please also note that the recording of this lecture, like the earlier ones, will be available via Baltimore Rotterdam Committee YouTube channel later on this week. Once the upload is available, we will communicate it to all who attended this afternoon evening event. Once again, thank you, Nico and Andrew. Thank you, Rachel and Jeremiah. Thank you to all the attendees for having been with us this evening, this night. And I wish you all a nice continuation of the week.